Hare Krishna, Bir Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so Some much for joining today for the Monks podcast. Since our meeting in North Carolina about four years ago, I have been constantly longing for your association with the Monks podcast. Fortunately, now it has worked out. So, thank you for making time. I thought we will today discuss based on your book, which is quite a pioneering book in our tradition. So, thank you for joining here, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Chaitanya Charan, and thank you for inviting me and helping me spread the mood of love and compassion and empathy uh, in our Krishna consciousness movement and the world at large. And before we start discussing anything, I would like to chant the prayers to Lord Nishingane. That's why I have the guitar here. Yes, uh, And the reason I want to do that is because I'm actually feeling overwhelmed with, uh, I would say, anxiety over the plight of the devotees in Ukraine and also in Russia and in other places in the world <clears throat> and the people in general in those particular locations. So I thought we'd pray for their safety and pray for people to develop compassion and empathy for others so that they don't attack each other and you know hurt each other. So let's chant the prayers to the Lord Nishingadev in that yes, regard. Ma'am. If that's all right with you. Yes, ma'am. Now, now when we chant, it's better that just I chant and you don't yes. chant in response because there's a delay with. Yes, yes, as you know. that's fine. And it that's sounds fine. really funny if people are responding and, you know, because it's like a half second delay in this. Yes, ma'am. That's fine. Thank you for letting me sing this because it's something that's constantly on my mind right now when I see all the people, the devotees, the refugees, uh, the attacks. It's just something just I just can't get out of my mind and I've been constantly praying uh, for the welfare of these living entities. Not only devotees, but everybody, because everyone's a part and parcel of Krishna. They're all our brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. So, where should we start? Do you want to ask a question? Yes, my Or should I start? <laughs> should I start Actually, this is a beautiful... 
yeah this is a beautiful segue thank you for the beautiful tradition of narsinga narsinga aarti so in one sense our topic was non violent communication and your prayer was for cessation of violence so in one sense you know most of us the devotees and upcoming devotees and our potential audiences we may not engage in physical violence so much we may not necessarily be a part of warfare but uh, we all tend to succumb to verbal violence in our communication at times and sometimes we may also think that that is the right thing to do because others are wrong and are having misconceptions and we have to remove them so that's a in one sense from the contemporary context of very shocking and ghastly physical violence to a little subtler but maybe much broader uh, context of verbal violence that's a very nice segue you brought right so you have written this book uh, realize, realizing our empathic self and there you draw non violent communication so maybe my first yes okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you so we will also keep a link on of the amazon link afterwards in the podcast uh, description below that those who want can get a copy so what inspired you maharaj to uh, study non violent communication and try to integrate or utilize it in in bhakti yoga or krishna consciousness okay uh, that's an interesting question what inspired me <coughs> is my experiences in iskon i joined the krishna consciousness movement uh 51 years ago that's a long time ago and mm-hmm. i had my expectations that uh everybody was going to be very very loving and uh people were not going to be finding faults with each other people were going to be understanding compassionate with each other and somehow or other my expectations were not met particularly in the early days of the movement uh where we had one may say that probably when probably was there there was there was no verbal abuse but actually there was a tremendous amount of verbal abuse I mean I got told one time that uh I was the only person who was the body everybody else was not the body <laughs> cuz I was so much in my and they like and uh you were saying you know, the time I said robots times or after robots times this is robots time oh okay this is robots time we were all very young and so uh in one, one time sense, said, sorry it was it's, it's almost like the philosophy was weaponize to bring subordination and almost uh humiliation you could say the way you you are body that's that's very shocking you are very shocking to hear in one sense yeah and another time i said to one senior devotee uh <coughs> senior meant that he was in the movement one year and more than me can i reveal my mind and he said no your mind is just garbage <laughs> so we personally i experienced a lot of i would say abuse i mean that's a little heavy but a lot of discouraging interactions and then i saw a lot of discouraging interactions between devotees you know people calling each other names and then i saw a lot of interactions between devotees and people outside the movement using a lot of uh negative designations and so it really inspired me to try to understand why is it that in a religious movement where everybody's supposed to be loving god and loving all of his parts and parcels we have these dynamics and so with that idea to try to find that out i started to research some academic and read some academic books about religious institutions not iskon in general mm-hmm. and it turns out that uh 80% of people who are in religious institutions are less empathic than people who are not in religious institutions and this is across the board this is not just iskon this is the catholic church the protestant denominations the jewish whatever denominations and so and but you got 20% of the people who are in religious denominations who are more compassionate So I wanted to find out, you know, why this disparity? 
You know, why such a lack of compassion amongst those people who are in religious institutions? And of uh, course, these are statistics. Uh, there was one person, uh, Joseph Campbell, for example. Mm. He was the one who came up with that statistics. There's other studies uh, that show the same thing. So uh, then in my studies to try to figure that out, I came across uh, someone named Marshall Rosenberg and his teachings of nonviolent communication. Maharaj, sorry, this is statistics. Sorry, just trying to interrupt you. The statistic is quite shocking. So it's I used to think that maybe we tend to be judgmental and you use some derogatory labels for people, but it seems it's across the board. So how how was empathy measured? Is it like by the pejorative labels that people use, the strong words that they use, or they just don't understand people? Or I mean, it seems that most religious traditions do talk about, uh, Jesus talks about love thy neighbor, and in our tradition we have Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is our family. Hmm. So, So what is it? What is it that you think that causes it? Uh, well, first you asked two questions. Yeah. You said, how is, empath how is empathy Measure. measured? Yeah, that's two questions, sorry, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I, it's measured in terms of people's perceptions of interactions with others. Oh. Because okay. perception, you know, if, I, if you say something to me and I perceive that you were being abusive, that perception is 100% correct, even though your intention was not being abusive. You understand? Perceptions oh, okay, okay. Okay, perceptions okay. are perceptions. Yeah. And you could even say that for people that... Though, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Even though your intention may have not been to, you know, criticize me or abusive or anything like that, but I am perceiving it like that. So you, me you measure empathy based upon the person who is perceiving... And you can't really measure it upon the person's intention because the person's definitely will tell you they don't have the intention to hurt others. Okay. So it's the perception. So anyway, so uh, in my in perception, sense, sorry, so in yeah, my sense, perception what of the interactions in the movement were actually, uh, you know, rather harsh. Yeah. Okay. That's true. So, so in one sense, it's nobody will say I'm not empathic. But if you ask, okay, how are your interactions with others in your community or in your religious group? Or if people feel that they are not, that they, they are not understood, they are not uh, cared for, that they are, uh, they are looked down upon or made to feel guilty, then then that would be a indication that they don't feel it empathy. So it's empathy is is something which ultimately has to be felt by the receiver. It's not a matter of just what the intention of the person is, but it's the experience of the other person. Yes, and, I, and also it can, it can be measured also by certain, like what we call hateful language. Oh, yeah. Like there was one Christian group, there was actually one Methodist group I just read about yesterday. They were going around and saying that everybody wasn't a member of that group was hated by God. You know, they had, it was really intense. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Hated by that, God, okay. God hate God hates you. So, anyway, so there, there's different standards of measure, yeah. and of course, then you can measure the uh, amount of violence in marriages. Uh, ver you know, there's a standard of uh, measuring verbal uh, abuse and uh, yeah. marriage yeah. abuse and sexual abuse and things like that. So, anyway, yeah. So yeah. there are different standards. But the point is, what's causing this in religions? And is it that religious people are naturally unempathic because God is unempathic? I mean, that's the question I <laughs> <laughs> That's a provocative you know religion. You know. We know that God is quite empathic and quite loving. Although sometimes, uh, sometimes it appears that he's not, uh, particularly who... Uh, people who talk about the subject matter of theodicy, you know, the justice of God. Yeah. You know, they say, you know, why are innocent people suffering and why are evil people enjoying? Uh, because they don't understand the law of karma. And it's actually quite an interesting subject matter. You may think that God is punishing you. Even devotees sometimes are thinking 
that God is punishing you because he wants to make you suffer for what you did. But that's not really why we're being punished by the law of karma. And we're getting into a different subject matter, but it's quite interesting. There's two, there's two theories of justice. One theory is retributive justice, and the other theory is called restorative justice. You may be familiar with that. Yes, my wife. So God is not uh, utilizing uh, retributive justice on us, nor is the law of karma a retributive law. It's a restorative law. In other words, if one understands teleologically the purpose of why God does things or why the law of karma acts in a particular way, you'll see it is meant for reformation. It is a compassionate law rather than a retributive law. And it is not that God is enjoying seeing people see people suffer, but uh, the law of karma employs the least painful way to rectify a living entity. Okay, so maybe we get back to your question about why religious institutions or why people who are religious are less compassionate or empathic? Yes, and, one thought uh, I had is sorry, if I may just rephrase it. Yeah, go ahead. one thought I had is that in almost all religions, to some extent, do create like an insider outsider divide, and in one sense, it is required for say the protection of the faith of the followers that associate with people who have the same faith, and while creating that divide there is often the denigration or even the demonization of outsiders. And uh, that could be one cause, but that, that will not explain, um, say, the harsh language used with insiders itself. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, let me get to that point. Yes. Um, so I started studying what's called empathic communication mm. or nonviolent communication. That was taught by uh, Marshall Rosenberg, and most of us thought, you know, this guy's in Maya, you know. And I was attending uh, intensive seminars, like ten or eleven day seminars, where you just live with other people practicing empathic communication, and studying his works, and studying uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and Maslow's teachings, which I think you're probably familiar with. He's yes, a psychologist, yeah. and. Uh, yes, one of the things that one yes, of the things that Maharaj on the podcast where we discuss Maslow's hierarchy elaborately, and he explained yeah. it in a Krishna conscious perspective also. Yes, please, please go ahead, Maharaj. So one one of the things I discovered was that uh, people who use in religious institutions or people who are religious, uh, they tend to use judgmental language more than people in general. They tend to label things. Now, in Krishna consciousness, we are taught, what is it, Sarvopati, Vanir Muktam, Tad Paratwena, Nir Malam, Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanam, Bhakti, Ruchate, that we should actually be free of upadis. Upadis means, of course, a designation, like I am American, I am white, I am this body, I am male, I am female, whatever upadi I have. And uh, unfortunately, in religious institutions, we have so many new labels for people. In my seminars, I actually encourage the devotees, we do a flip chart exercise, to come up with positive and negative labels for others. And it is amazing. We go through like five, six, ten pages of labels that we have for Devotees and non-devotees, you know, demon, rakshasa, malacha, uh, fallen, jerk, uh, <laughs> mental <laughs> platform. I mean, it's it's pretty blissful. I uh, know it's not blissful. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So, so, it's interesting. So, sorry. So I just said, you know, when you talk about Saropadi, Vinirmuktam, that verse, often we think of that I should not associate with any of my designations. So I'll say I'm not my body. I'm not an Indian. But we put a lot of labels on others, which is quite, uh, you could say, ironic. <laughs> it's a very striking point. I never thought of it that perspective. Yeah, so, so we're, we're expert in Upadis. <laughs> and every religion is. I mean, it's not, we are not unique. When we're talking about the sociology of religion, we fall, we're typical 
religion in terms of our sociology, in terms of our interactions and personal interactions, etc. And so most religions, like you see, if someone is not a uh, Muslim, what do they call? You can tell me that. Kafir. Kafir. Infidel. Yeah. Infidel! You know, infidel! Oh my God! You're an infidel, Chaitanya Charat. So... <laughs> Christian so, is the word pagan. So that's, every religion has that, yeah. Yeah, pagan. And, and the religion that I was uh, brought up in is the Jewish religion. And uh, we had a name for everybody who wasn't Jewish because only Jewish people were supposed to be saved. You know, we're the chosen people. Did you know that? Anyway, so... <laughs> okay. And so we call, uh, we call them Goyims. It's a really... Pejorative word. Okay. <laughs> and that and then also between the different groups of Jewish people, you had the Reform, the Conservative, Orthodox, Kassidim, and all these different groups. They would they would criticize each other for being fallen in different ways like that. So but we in Krishna consciousness have more derogatory words than any other religion in the world world, which is really interesting. It's quite interesting, <laughs> and and <laughs> and if you, <laughs> and if you read the Gita, we did a course in the Gita a while ago, an online course. The word demon is used so many times, and in the Western world, the word demon means someone with fangs, you know, and, and antennas or a tail or something like that, like the devil. <laughs> and so we tend to look at others and look at our ourselves and through these designations. And the interesting thing about these designations, they're static. They're not ecstatic. What do I mean by static? That means once you put a label on someone or something, that's how you see them from now on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that is true. We almost so, like re reduce that person to that. And then we don't even consider that the person might change or the change also be downplayed. In that sense, yes. You don't see the person as a person anymore. Like, you know, I, I tell you, the first time I met you, <laughs> the, I put a label on you immediately. Of course, you probably don't want... No, the label is actually something you'd probably be ecstatic about. Uh, the label was intelligent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that is not a good label because I'm not seeing you as a person anymore. Even a positive label that we put on someone is a designation because I'm not saying you're not intelligent. That's not my point. Mm. But the point is that you are a person. I mean, you have feelings, you're, you know, you're holistic. You have needs, you have feelings, you have relationships, you have, you know, whatever. Your, li your life is, cannot be reduced, in, you know, it's reductionism to this intelligent designation. And we generally do that with people. And that's really what keeps us from connecting to each other. We're not dynamic in our relationships, we're static in our relationships. And it's interesting that uh, sociologists have investigated different societies where they don't have the verb to be, you know, you're to be or be. Like, you know, these are called a process languages. Process languages, they don't, they can't say, you are this, you are that. They can say, you are going here. Uh, you are acting in a way that's causing me pain, but you can't say you are that, you know, there's the verb to be or all, in all of its declinations is not even used in those like in those societies. Mm. And there's less violence. Less violence, Amazing. because there's violence. We're like Prabhupada said, what did Prabhupada said? Give the dog a bad name and hang him. Right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Probably. So, what you're trying so, to say, so, it's something which is ingrained in language itself. The language itself will reflect what was going to happen over here. 
yeah, language reflects consciousness to a great de great degree. I mean, even in other aspects, I know because I speak some different languages. I speak Spanish, for example. And when I start speaking Spanish, I start thinking in Spanish, and I feel differently because of language. So, but that has nothing to do with the designations. So, getting back to your question about, you wanted to talk about, uh, like, the conflict between India and the West right now. Uh -huh. I will come to that a little later because it's very interesting. <laughs> now it's very much is connected. Okay. This I is guess like you can. Also associated labels. <laughs> this is labels. Mm. Like, if you, if you notice... Uh, the labels, the ad hominem labels that are there in the conflict, and I don't want to get into the details of the conflict, you know, who, who's right. Obviously, I'm right and you're wrong, but that's another subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if you, if you see the labels, you, you, write, you see the labels that people are putting on other people, uh, other groups of people, you know, chauvinistic, uh, and uh, what is it, you know, Western materialism, isn't it? You'll actually you see in the writings of both parties that it's divisive language, labeling. And I think that's the primary cause of the conflict because you're not seeing others as individual beings with their needs. The whole point of empathic communication is to not approach people through the labels, but to approach people as entities or persons who have needs, and they are functioning their uh, feeling because of needs met or unmet, which is actually what Maslow talks about. Now, you may say uh, that I'm in Maya talking about needs, you know, you are needy or whatever. Uh, and I'd like to quote from Bhaktivinoda Thakur about needs, because actually this is one of the uh, reasons I became inspired to research into Maslow, into nonviolent communication, because of my readings in Bhaktivinoda Thakur's works. Let me just read this quote, which I actually saved. Uh, from all, this is from the Bhakti Loka of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. From all these conclusions, the Srimad Bhagavatam, it should be understood that performing devotional service to Lord Hari is the only purpose of life. There's no other purpose. Unless one makes the gross and subtle bodies favorable for devotional service, one cannot engage in such. There is a need for some arrangement in order to attain a favorable condition in these two bodies. First, in order to maintain the gross body, there is a need to accumulate a house, household items, grains and drinks, for the prosperity of the subtle body, one needs proper knowledge and proper occupation. In order to make the bodies completely favorable for devotional service, there's a need to situate them above the modes of nature. Due to the results of fruit of activities from time immemorial, whatever nature and desires a living entity develops is certainly a mixture of goodness, passion, and ignorance. By first enriching the mode of goodness, one should diminish and defeat passion and ignorance and make goodness prominent. Anyway. So we are a need fulfilling entities. Mm. And that this is real this is the source of our motivation. When you're talking about the study of motivation, it's to fulfill needs. And of course, as you're probably aware, the ultimate need is Krishna consciousness to connect to Krishna, connect to all living entities in relationship to Krishna. But before we can actually come to that point, we have to fulfill what I would term, or Maslow would term, the uh, lower needs. Uh, because if you don't fulfill those lower needs, then they become more prominent and cover your understanding of your Krishna consciousness. Does that make sense? Yes, Maharaj. So this is, so in one sense, what you what you're saying is that if a person is not emotionally secure or not emotionally satisfied then that person will not be able to focus on krishna conscious cultivation also am i or he, or, or his uh, emotional dissatisfaction or his physical dissatisfaction will color him
understanding and performance of Krishna consciousness. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so need fulfillment is re is really important. And I, and, and Prabhupada uh, talks about this in the story of Gajendra, Gajendra Mokshana in the wow. Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes. How Gajendra was not able to fight Maya because, or not able to fight the crocodile, <laughs> which the crocodile symbolized Maya. And Gajendra is, symbolizes a devotee, is metaphorical for a devotee. So he was not able to fight the crocodile because he was out of his natural environment. In other words, his needs were not being met, uh, using in the metaphorical sense. Like if a devotee's needs are not being met, and Prabhupada related that to someone being in different ashrams and having different needs and uh, emotional needs and social needs, etc., like that, then one will not be strong enough to fight Maya. And then one's, then one's performance of Krishna consciousness will be highly covered by one's desire to fulfill needs. It will not be transcendental. Okay. So what would uh, that means? We as a we as a community, if not as a movement itself, we need to ensure that each other's, at least in this context, physical and emotional needs are well taken care of. Now there is a tendency is to put from the other perspective that emotional needs are all sometimes just talked about as you know this is just you are on the mental platform and you are complaining, you are whining, you are listening to your mind, just neglect your mind. So how does one differentiate emotional needs from just the, the, the voice of the mind which is complaining or demanding or whatever? Well, the point is if the mind is complaining, whining, whatever it's doing, or getting angry, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, indicates, it indicates something else. Just like anger. Let's take anger for example. We're supposed to deal with anger, you know, vacho vegam, manasa krota vegam, jiva vegam, udra pashta vegam. Uh, one has to be able to tolerate anger. Okay. So you can do several things if you experience anger. We're talking about one aspect of the mind's fluctuations. One is you can repress it. Another one is you can suppress it. There's more options, but anyway, let's just talk about those two. So repression means you deny that you're angry. I'm not angry, Prabhu! <laughs> okay. I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've seen that before. I'm not angry. <laughs> yeah. But I agree. And another one is you actually suppress it. And suppressing means you're, you're aware of what you're doing. Okay. Like well, that. You know, body language. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a significant <laughs> difference. So, so, there's, there's so difference, but what is happened, denying, denying to oneself, and the other is restraining from expressing to others. Yes, being aware of it and restraining to expressing to others. But the problem was in, in both cases, it pops out eventually. Anger pops out as you know some physical disease. You get a physical disease, or it'll come out. Just like if you if you ever seen people make uh, figures out of balloons, did you ever see that? Like they take balloons and they squeeze them. No. Okay. No. Uh, I'm sure okay. you have balloons in India. Yeah, I mean, but balloons we have. So people make figures. Okay. Yeah. Figures. Yeah. So if you if you take a balloon and it's not completely filled with air, and you squeeze one portion, then the other portion fills. Right. Mm, okay. Yes. Because the air is there. Mm. So the anger, whether you suppress or repress anger, it's going to come out. And it may come out in a very unhealthy way and you may get, I mean, I hate to say this, but sometimes cancer is caused by repressed anger. You know, mm. the Ayurvedic physicians are aware of that. By different emotional states, diseases can come. So instead of repressing and suppressing, uh, I would recommend... Controlling the anger by becoming aware of it and understanding what need it is connected with. Then the, then the anger dissipates. Mm. For example, right now, 
right now because I have not eaten breakfast. <laughs> Because <laughs> you got you got me to have this podcast at this time of the morning. Uh, I I might be like a little bit more edgy than normal. You know, edgy. Okay, yes. <laughs> I'm not really angry, but I meant I'm just giving an example. I might be. Okay. You know, someone approached me at this time of the morning and said, uh, "Marge, can I ask you for advice?" I probably probably want to yell at them. So. <laughs> But the re okay. So, so the point of dealing with anger or the emotion, or any mental fluctuation or emotional fluctuation, would be to become aware of it. Okay, I'm angry. But why am I angry? Instead of beating myself up, oh, I'm in Maya. I'm supposed to be a sannyasi. I'm supposed to control my anger. I am so horrible. I'm useless. I'm hopeless. You know, this is what we generally do. Not me. Other people generally do become either you become depressed or you actually get angry. So instead, I said, "Yeah, I'm angry. Why am I angry? Well, probably my blood sugar is down. I have a need for prasadam right now. Okay. Once I'm aware of it, once I'm aware of it, even if I'm not able to eat, the anger dissipates. Yes, because I'm no longer." blaming you or in denial of mm. my anger or you know in denial that i'm responsible for it i'm responsible for my anger but it's connected to something mm. and i find this is a very effective way to tolerate as uh nectar of instruction says you know vacho vega manasa crota vega to tolerate the anger or the pushings every single pushing that we have whether it's you know uh, vacho vegum, you know, the tongue, belly, genitals, whatever, is due to some need that's not being met. And oftentimes, yeah, oftentimes we take the wrong strategy to fulfill mm. that. Ah, yes, that's beautiful. In one sense, every, you could say, unwanted or unhealthy or a disruptive emotion is pointing us to some healthy need which needs to be addressed. And from Taking from the perspective of our, con our topic, so in our interactions, so we could say that we should be helping each other understand our needs. But if you just put a label on that, you know, you're short-tempered, you are in Maya, you are just on the mental platform, yeah. then we are not actually helping each other. We are only making, we are making things worse even for that person because we don't help them understand themselves. We only maybe make them feel guilty or make them feel resentful, make them feel lonely and ununderstood. Hmm. Yeah, so so I, I want to be really clear about one thing. The anger is not bad. <laughs> yeah. And anger is not bad. It's simply a sign. If you get into the anger, then, you know, that's not good. And just, like, demolish everybody in your path. But it's a sign that something needs to be dealt with. I mean, I often use the example of someone who's driving a car. You're driving a car... And one of the lights goes on on your dashboard, the oil light. I think you probably know what I'm talking about, right? Mm, yes, yeah. So the oil light is not the problem. It's indicating another problem. So if you get angry, I know people, devotees, you know, who drive a car, the oil light goes on, and they just disconnect the light. <laughs> oh god okay <laughs> it's a common thing or the the typical thing is you know the gas gauge goes down to empty and they just think you know you know christian will take care of me okay. I, had one, and it, <laughs> yeah. it, I had one devotee i said it's empty and they said no no christian will christian will help you and i he was he was driving i said christian's not going to help us and then thing ran out of gas and I had to be the one to walk two or three miles to get some gas to fill in the car. So, so, so anyway, so I don't see anger as a bad thing. You know, we, of course, to express it inappropriately is not what we want to do. But to express it appropriately, just to be aware, I am angry. Therefore, I have this need. Let me pick some strategy to fulfill that need. That is true. In one sense, you know, you could also say that anger indicates that we care. And sometimes 
outrage about something which is something terrible that has happened if that is not there then in one sense nothing in the world would ever be fixed so anger anger it as you rightly said anger itself is not bad maybe how it is expressed can make it bad so That's anger right. indicate yes ma'am it could be something wrong inside it could be wrong something wrong outside and it needs as you said it needs fixing it's a symptom of something you know like we learned from the bible we get to that you know jayate vishap pun sam sango station pajay they sang god sang jayate kama kama krodha pajayate that when you contemplate sense objects you become attached and attached to lust and the lust turns to anger so the anger is a symptom hmm. that you've been contemplating something you know so i always take anger or any emotion feeling uh, other than spiritual emotions i mean obviously you know if i roll on the ground in ecstasy <laughs> <laughs> exhibiting a, a century bob anyway so <laughs> then i just take that as a symptom that you know i love krishna <laughs> i'm speaking jokingly you know obviously about this you know no one should take me that you know this guy's a sahaja that's a label you know <laughs> that's not a label <laughs> it's very sharp yeah it's true so uh what else would you like to know about empathic communication i mean it it's yeah it's it a big thing i guess there's a couple of yeah. points that yeah. on earlier point you made that uh, that we as a movement seem to have more designations than others so other religious groups also so that it is one sense isn't it that uh, to some extent our own scriptures and our own teacher our acharyas have used labels so if krishna says there are four kinds of people who come to me four kinds of people who don't come to me yeah. and mm-hmm. in one sense from a functional perspective some kind of uh, maybe we the word labeling has a negative connotation but some kind of identifying mark is required so like you said that intelligent or not intelligent or whatever you know if you want to give some service to someone unless we have some identifying mark okay this person is is intellectual so they can do this service but this person may not be able to do this service because they are not so are right. are so sometimes labels can be identifiers and are they always bad no 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 i i wouldn't say labels are bad uh we can use them inappropriately uh when we disconnect when we when we use them it disconnects us from the person like if i see you okay. as intelligent and that's my vision of you that is an appropriate but if i see that you know i need someone to analyze a particular philosophical work and a chaitanya nitran has that ability to do it okay then that's a way to see it so i i would translate you know when when prabhu uses the word demon i would translate that person is acting demoniacally oh i would try I would translate that into process language. So that's how you or let's say it won't be a it won't be a static label then. That yeah. is more of, okay. Like you you're you're that uh you know you're acting intelligently, you know, it's this process instead of you are intelligent. I mean sometimes we do use the static de- designation, but I have to be very careful not to see you like that. Because then I am depersonifying you. Yeah. you know we have we we have this need to react to interact with each other in in empathic ways and loving ways and as soon as we as long as i see you as intelligent then i really can't like you that's fascinating <laughs> i never thought till now that even positive labels could be a problem so you know in- yeah but it's the same thing you're saying he was in the embodied or male or something yeah. like that okay it's an apart it's an apartheid yes i'm aware that you're wearing saffron i am aware that your color of your skin is a certain way i mean these things are all there but i i see beyond that yes and until you know until we see beyond that we're not going to have peace between different devotees or different nationalities or different races or anything like that mm. yes ma'am so we can say that when krishna is used and when you talk about his process it strike me so much 
Krishna in 4, 7, 15 and 16 uses these labels, but then actually he immediately talks about this Chaturvida, Bhajante, Maam, those four kind of people come to me. He talks yeah. about how they are progressing on the journey in the next, and the Jnani, become, they become Jnanavan, they surrender wow. to him. So it's a process over there. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's all process. It's all I see it as a whole process language. And even even though you find Prabhupada, I mean it's interesting the Gita, the if you had to do a count of the uh number of times Prabhupada uses the word demon, it's really interesting in the Gita. But Prabhupada didn't interact with people like that. You know, it's one thing when you're establishing a philosophy so you can understand clear distinctions between ways uh, you know, between ways of acting, uh, that's one thing. But Prabhupada never treated people like that. I mean, Prabhupada had friends where they were not devotees. Prabhupada visited them, had loving relationships with them. Prabhupada never th saw them as demons. Mm. So you're saying uh, that so Prabhupada was able to see everyone as a soul, even when he used certain, certain particular strong words to describe them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Prabhupada, Prabhupada uh, was compassionate towards a bug that was on a flower. He didn't see, you know, he's a stupid bug on a flower. A Lord, uh, Shivananda Saint was uh, fasting because the dog had not been fed. You know the story in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yes. You know, so, so I mean, basically, the devotees, pure devotees, see beyond the body. And they see beyond someone's uh, manifestations of what may be termed as demoniac qualities, but they see the pure spirit soul. And Prabhupada saw that in us. You know, even though in the beginning, in, you know, 1967, 68, the devotees acted in such ways that were just wild. Prabhupada didn't see us as just like animals. You know, he saw us as acting like animals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a difference between acting like an animal and being an animal. Mm. That's true. So, even the... So, you made an interesting point earlier that for, from a philosophical perspective or understanding philosophy, there has to be some amount of categorization, like drawing of yeah. boundaries or distinctions. But... We cannot literally use that in our interpersonal interactions. So, inter so there's one is a philosophical understanding, and the other is the the way we deal with people. And, and the way with the way we see people, the way we see people, it's not it's not just the words. Okay. Body language, body language, and tone of voice speak louder than words. Yes. So we really have to transcend our vision and actually see everyone, you know, uh, as part and parcel of Krishna, brothers and sisters like that. Uh, as Krishna states in the Gita, that, you know, we, Mama Vansa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, Hambija Pradapita. You know, I'm, I'm the seed giving father. And, you know, I, I just see, when I see people who are not, performing Krishna conscious activities. I just see that they have forgotten who they are. They have amnesia. Prabhupada used that example too. Hmm. You know, because I know this is controversial, but Krishna conscious is, is inherent in every living entity's heart. That's what the Chaitanya Charitamrita says. It's not yes, my philosophy. <laughs> and they've forgotten. And when I approach people, my feeling is that I have to just waken them up to their real nature. They're not demons, rakshasas. I mean, obviously, if someone's eating meat, they're, <laughs> they're, they're doing the activities of a rakshasa, but they're not rakshasas. Yeah. And then you can also think why they are doing it. Maybe they never had any alternative. They grew, grew up in a culture where that was just the norm. So yeah, they're, they're, conditioned, they're, conditioned. they're conditioned. deliberately doing it out of cruelty to animals. They don't even make a connection for most much of their life that actually this is a product of violence toward animals. Yeah, they, they don't make that connection. I mean, in one sense, they're innocent. Mm. That's striking. So, so, that innocent is, is a good insight. We normally <laughs> not think of that, but it's so true. 
yeah, I mean, they're innocent. Of course, then, then you're going to ask the question, I sort of read some of the questions you wanted to ask, what about the Madhamadakari is supposed to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, <laughs> Can you read that? Yes. Yeah. Between uh, the innocent and the envious. So how do I deal with someone, or how would I deal with someone who's envious? I would stay away from them because they're acting enviously. Again, I put it in a process language type of thought. They're acting enviously, and so it would be useless and hopeless for me to try to deal with them. At the same time, they have certain needs, but their needs, their basic needs are so strong that they can't see the truth. And they haven't fulfilled those basic needs. For example, I mean, like the example Prabhupada gives is sometimes someone takes to impersonalism or voidism because they've actually had so many traumatic experiences in this life. So they can't in reality. Like we, uh, I'm doing a lot of interaction. I'm not going to use the P word, preaching word, but I'm doing a lot of interaction at the university with students, you know, Western students. And a lot of them follow this person from Vrindavan, you know, Nim Karoli Baba. You've probably heard of him before. Yes. And he's basically impersonalism. And I point out to them, that means you have no relationships, no fun. You, and they say, well, you just become love. I said, well, you got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this before. But, to, but love means there's a lover and beloved. And they both love each other. And there's exchanges and there's differences of opinion. I mean, that's what love means. But they can't envision it because of past experiences of interpersonal relations, mm. which we call PTSD. So <laughs> okay. when I, okay. PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. So when I see it's someone- normal, no, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm really appreciating how you're using language from a different context here to convey the gravity of the point. Normally we talk about PTSD in terms of say, some, brutal violence, bomb explosion, and person. But even our relationships can leave us with trauma that is similar mm, interactions yeah, with people, yes. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely, I mean, I'll give you an example of PTSD. I mean, it's a funny example. That uh, after Prabhupada left the planet, I had, I was traumatized by the guru situation in Iskand. And so, because of that PTSD, I, want, I went somewhere to start a temple where there were no gurus. <laughs> and then, of course, then, of course, I became one, you know, you can't beat them, join it. But I, join them. <laughs> so, 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 people generally, I find in the modern world, people who are really like gung-ho and personalists have had so much bad experience in their personal relationships that they can't envision a personal reality, a personal spiritual reality. Therefore, I don't approach the, I mean, I don't try to convince them because, you know, they're, they're tra traumatized. But I understand them. So in other words, someone's acting demoniacally or, you know, against Krishna or an impersonalist or voidist or something like that. They're in intense pain. I have so much compassion for them because they they cannot con connect with Krishna because of their past trauma. And so I feel very compassionate for these people and therefore I'll just give them some prasadam or, you know, whatever. Sprinkle them with a little holy water. <laughs> you know, this beautiful, what you have said, it just reminded me of in, in Bhurjan Rose, My Glorious Master, there is an incident yeah. where Prabhupada is speaking and he's saying a pure devotee play praise to Krishna. These fools and rascals are suffering in material existence. Please deliver them. So that label, Prabhupada is using it, but the using the label is not actually in any way decreasing his compassion for them. That's right. But sometimes when we use label, it just becomes compassion becomes replaced by condescension or something worse also. Yeah, so my understanding is when Prabhupada uses these labels. He's usually using them not in a static sense, but in a, di uh, in, a, in a dynamic sense, in a, a process sense, that the person is acting demoniacally. And, and I'll use the labels too. You know, I'll just say, oh, he's a rascal. But I'm thinking 
uh, dynamically. I'm thinking process-wise rather than static-wise. Hmm. And we, and I always have to, you know, being a conditioned soul, you know, I hate to admit it, but uh, I always have to check myself too because I, we all, I mean, at least I have the tendency to put static labels on people. Hmm. So when I do that, I'm thinking, you know, I'm putting a static label on someone, but they are not that label. They are feeling, thinking, uh, need fulfilling entities. And ultimately, ultimately, <clears throat> when all of our needs are fulfilled, we'll seek out Krishna consciousness. And one of the main needs, I, I thought this was quite interesting, one of the main needs that all living entities have is the need for love and compassion. And I'm referring to even non-human entities. There's an interesting story that I tell uh, when I'm giving the seminar on empathic communication about a lady one time who was scuba diving. And of course, you probably know what scuba diving is. She was under the water with her tank. Yeah. And she felt this whale that kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. You know, whales don't eat people, so, uh, so it's not even dangerous. But the whale was pushing her, and she was wondering, why is this whale pushing me? Finally, after about 10 minutes, she looks around and find out that the, finds out that the whale is actually protecting her from a shark. So in other words, the whale was feeling compassion and love and because the whale's needs were fulfilled, and of course the whale didn't need its, to fulfill its need of eating by eating the person. So, oh, okay. so, so when you we, say find, we find... Love, sorry, I just... This, Yes, you're making a very striking one. So when you're saying need for love and compassion, it is not that we want to be the object, but we also want to offer it to others. That, that is also a need for us. Yeah, that's the highest need for every living entity. Oh. When, but that need can only be expressed in the conditioned state. No, I'm not talking about a liberated state now. I'm talking about in the conditioned state. It can only be expressed when our lower needs are fulfilled. Like if you're hungry... If you're tired, if you're frustrated in some need, it's going to be very hard to speak philosophy, to give a Bhagavatam class. And so the needs definitely need to be fulfilled to actually execute Krishna consciousness or be compassionate towards others. Okay. So we could say that when you earlier said, can I share my mind with you? So in one sense, the Guhiyam Akhyati Pruchati that is there, that is actually within our tradition itself. There is a means to uh, actually open our heart and reveal our reveal our innermost thoughts. And a person will not be able to do that if the other person is dismissive or using violent communication. So, in one sense, that's that non-violent communication would be especially required for 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 close close sharing of the heart. Yes. And of course, that's the Dati Pratigranati Guyam Akyati Prichati. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes, Maharaj. So. Which is, which is required. And, uh, but, but also, part of uh, empathic communication, I'm using empathic communication, nonviolent communications uh, synonymously. Okay. But empathic communication is what I teach. And, you know, it is connected to nonviolent communication. Mm. But that's how I label it. So uh, one, one aspect of uh, being an empathic living entity is being so secure in your own identity that you can be vulnerable. In other words, be willing to speak even when people may criticize you for saying what you're saying. And in other words, you have to love yourself first. Because when we're talking about compassion, Compassion begins with us. Loving yourself means loving not the body, you know, of course we have to take care of the body, it belongs to Krishna, but loving yourself is part and parcel of Krishna. You know, if you say that to devotees sometimes, you have to love yourself. You say, that's that's Maya. You have to hate yourself, basically, you know, <laughs> self-flagellation, like, like the monks in the uh, Catholic Church used to do, you beating themselves. Like that? No, you. Because Krishna loves you. 
Krishna loves all of his parts and parcels, and you're one of his parts and parcels, right? As far as I figured yes. out. <laughs> so, so it's important to love your... I love myself, and I, I, I'm concerned with meeting my needs. It's not Maya. I have a certain need for friendship. I have a certain need for social interaction. I have a need for autonomy, you know, making my own decisions in life. And one, one of the problems, oh my God, here I go, political. Anyway, so one of the problems in a religious institution is you have this whole authority structure and, you know, you get to ask this question. I don't get asked the question since I'm one of the gurus, but uh, you get this question sometimes, who is your authority? You know, like you're a five-year-old boy and you need someone to change your diapers. <coughs> oh, like oh, so, so what you find in religious institutions, here's another dynamic we find in this cup. In total religious institutions where they control your life, you know, with authority and everything like that, is that you actually, your need for autonomy is not met. And you become dysfunctional in many different ways. Yes, fine. This was one of the strike, most striking points I found in your book. And you give examples of even in day-to-day -day life, if soldiers come back from the war, they're so used to following orders that they can't join, they join civilian life because there's nobody to give them orders and they don't know what to do. So at that time, it had struck me that we focus so much on following instructions that Prabhupada also gave the other instruction of independent thoughtfulness. <laughs> Right. Which we hardly ever talk about. So, and often the often the uh, the the polemic is that our independence is what got us into the material world, and that is what is going to keep us here. So we have to give up our independence. So could we differentiate a little between that independent mentality and autonomy? If possible. Well, independent independent mentality in relationship to Krishna means to to do things that are not pleasing to Krishna. But we have our free will, our autonomy to choose to understand what would be pleasing to Krishna. For example, in my own life, I'm thinking when I make a decision, what would Prabhupada want me to do in a particular circumstance? And I make my decision based on that. And okay. I've internalized my connection with Srila Prabhupada. Hopefully I've internalized my connection with Srila Prabhupada. So I don't really need someone externally telling me what to do. And that would make me extremely dysfunctional or angry or rebellious. And when you do that with children, it has the same result. Mm. It makes them rebellious or uh, even when they, all right, let's say, let's say they conform to the authority. Let's say a, a devotee conforms to the authority. Then you lose your moral compass. I don't know if you've heard that word before, moral yeah, compass. Yeah. Moral compass means the ability to decide what is moral and what is immoral. And that's what happened in World War II with the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, just following orders. They lost their moral compass, the ability. Not everyone, I meant many of them didn't. This is it's part of what, what I call crowd or group psychology, which is another subject matter I could give a whole seminar on. Yeah. So you lose you lose your moral compass and you do things like for example you'd go out in Sangadon and to distribute more books you you're 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 willing to lie and cheat and whatever you have to do to get more money from people mm. but just following orders and that's you find that in religious institutions in governmental institutions in political parties that people give up their own own moral compass. I've seen this in America, in our American politics, quite a bit. Yeah. That leaders, you know, members of the Congress have given up or sacrificed their own moral compass to follow the leader. The leader. And that's very, very dangerous. Mm. So it's gone, like Prabhupada said, absurd, inqu absurd inquiries, uh, blind following and absurd inquiries are condemned. He says right in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, you know, many religious institutions, and this gone to a certain extent, are based upon trying to shape behavior by rewards and punishment. 
Like if you want to get a recommendation for initiation, you got to do a certain amount of hours of service in the temple. You got to get certain donations to the temple. You got to please the temple president. You know, from the very beginning, it's what we call a domination culture. And when you train people up with rewards and punishment, it's like training a pet dog or a or you shouldn't even train the dog that way, or training, like they have these uh, dolphins or porpoises that are pets, not pets, but they're in, they're in display in different sea aquariums or aquariums, and they train them up by giving them fish every time they do something nice. So so in many cases, we, we may be training devotees like that too, you know, with positive and negative reinforcement, you know, behavioral psychology. You've heard of behavioral psychology before? Yes, yes, that's so true. B. B. F. Skinner. Yes, much. So this is. I was just thinking that what you are speaking is is quite different from the way things happen in our movement quite a bit. So when you speak these things, or you do the seminars, is it quite provocative for the devotees, other leaders, or it's like a breath of relief? Oh. You're all thinking like this, and somebody is articulating it now. Yeah, yeah, it's something like the emperor's new clothes. You know, they sorry, the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> the, the em <laughs> no clothes, I have heard. Emperor's new clothes. The emperor has no clothes. That's I heard. Okay, the new clothes are no clothes. Okay. Yeah, the new clothes are no, are no clothes. Okay. And finally, one one little boy, you know, one little sannyasi says, <laughs> "Hey, the emperor's naked." So. Uh, I, I, I find generally when people take the seminars that uh, they, they, they're very happy with it. I haven't found any negative responses from my seminars. Even the managers you know. and the leaders of the movement? No, I mean, they're very happy. I get invited to do seminars. I've done a number of them in different temples like Chicago, uh, Gita Nagri. Of course, in Europe, I've done quite a few of the seminars in uh, Germany and uh, Croatia, Slovenia, all these different places, and Sweden. Not in, not in India. Actually, in India, India I did one uh, one time before Mayapur, we had this uh, different seminars that were presented by different devotees. I did it, and, and people really liked it. So... Yeah. So I haven't had, I really haven't had any negative feedback. Of course, you know, the people, people yeah. who would be negative don't go to the seminars anyway. <laughs> don't go That's a good way of putting it. Because they, they've already, they've already put a label on me, you know, new age, liberal, uh, feminist. You know, I, I got all these wonderful labels I'm, I'm walking around with every day. <laughs> okay. So overall... We could also say that as our movement is growing, yeah. in one sense, if there's too much of authority structure, then it puts a lot of pressure even on the authorities. Because how many devotees can one personally guide? Even if, like you said, one is one one is well intentioned, still it's very difficult. So in that sense, so I was just thinking of the difference between independent mentality and autonomy. Independent mentality, we could say, is I just don't want to serve Krishna. But autonomy is, we can say, I use my intelligence and my free will to decide how I can serve Krishna. That's right. Yes. And to That's right. So the, the question is, how many people can we guide? <coughs> I think I can guide unlimited people because I'm not going to be responsible for them. I mean, this is the whole thing about being a guru. <clears throat> many times people think, wow, you know, you're responsible for all your disciples if some of them falls down. Then you're, it's you did something wrong. Or you should have done this. You know, I realize everybody has their own free will. You know, the guidance can be there, like Prabhupada's giving guidance to everyone, but he's not responsible for, or whether we take or reject his guidance. So I don't, I I I don't feel responsible for what someone does with my guidance. In the you know, if I felt responsible, that's that's codependency. Then I become controlled by the person. Oh. You know, that's a very that's very sick. You know, you find the gurus sometimes they become very sick, like codependent on their disciples. Oh my God, this disciple did this, this disciple did that. Ah, that's free will. And the way I look at that is that at least they started their devotional service. 
So here you know, I'm not. Re- I'm only responsible for my own feelings and needs, and I can try to be compassionate and help other people understand their feelings and needs. But everybody has to take personal responsibility. So when you are using the word responsible, if I understand right, you are using it more in the sense of culpable. Like a, the guru no. has the responsibility to do guide the disciple, but that yeah. is duty, and the duty is to be done. But when you say the responsibility, the disciple something does something wrong, the guru is not culpable for that. The guru That's right. Do the guru is not culpable, nor do I get the credit for it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but is you know, I, I get the credit for my own, whatever service I'm doing, whatever is in my heart, my devotion. It's the quality, not the quantity. Mm. You know, I, I mean, of course, of course, Krishna may be pleased with me if I if I give someone some spiritual instruction and or bring someone to Krishna consciousness, but the point the point to me is not my credit. The point is that they accepted it. Hmm. So that's amazing. Way it's a very selfless way of looking at it. What you are saying, but here, so the. The way I'm connecting this with non-violent communication is that uh, you are saying that aut- we are talking about autonomy, and autonomy also means that we don't take risk, take culpability for others' actions. That they have their autonomy, and we need to respect that. We give right. them guidance, and then so autonomy has both sides. That autonomy does means we don't force them to do something, follow us, and then we don't feel guilty when they don't do what we are telling us to do. Both ways. That's right. Respecting their autonomy, <clears throat> and we have our autonomy to do, you know, do what we're supposed to do to help them. But whatever whatever we do to help them has to be done voluntarily and joyfully. And if you and if my autonomy is impinged upon, I won't be doing things joyfully uh, and voluntarily. I'll be doing it in a forced way. You know, someone says to me, I mean, let's let's take chanting my rounds. Why do I chant my rounds every day? You know, most devotees will say, I chant my rounds because I have to, I'm supposed to. Now, that's a disconnect from the rounds. When you do anything because you have to, you're supposed to, you must do it. Oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't do it. That's a disconnect. I mean, I chant my rounds every day <coughs> because I want to please Prabhupada, I want to connect with Krishna. I want to be empowered to preach. I want to. Uh, I want to be Krishna conscious. I'm choosing to jam my rounds every day. I don't have to do anything. Okay. That's really important to understand. You don't have to do anything. I didn't have to come on to this uh, conference today with you. I chose to do it. Mm. You know, I don't want to go. To, I don't want to do something that's not fun. That I'm not choosing to do. I don't personally. I don't do anything that's not fun. That may come as a shock coming from the sannyasi. But as a question, <laughs> but if you're cho- choosing to do things, it's fun. Like Mangalarti, I go to Mangalarti every morning. Most mornings, unless I'm awake all night, pretty cheap. But I'm choosing. And I, I, I'm choosing to go to Mangalarti. I want to see the deities. I want to dance. I want to hear the holy name. Instead of thinking Krishna consciousness is a bunch of rules and regulations, because <clears throat> that's, that's also called Niyamagraha, right? Niyamagraha, mm-hmm. just rules and regulations for their own sake. I'm taking Krishna consciousness in terms of why I'm doing what I'm doing. But the problem is most devotees that I see, know what they're doing, when they're doing, how they're doing, but they don't think of why they're doing. Does that make sense? That's beautiful. And often what happens is, based on our conceptions about that person, we ascribe motivation. And they must be doing this because of this. So that could also be a problem. That can also lead to labeling and things like that. Yeah. So it's always being... (coughs) Excuse me. It's always important to be connected to the why question, and then one will always be enthusiastic because mm. you're connecting with the heart. I'm fulfilling a certain need, like I'm talking to you here, because I'm a, I'm fulfilling several needs by talking to you, because I 
I really like you as a friend. Of course, we haven't seen each other that much. But uh, when, I, when I first saw you, no, I didn't only think you were intelligent. <laughs> I thought, boy, but here's someone I'd really like to get to know. You know, he's, I felt immediate kinship. So uh, I'm enjoying talking to you. Because I feel, you know, here's a brother. Here's someone I can relate to. Here's an intelligent person. <laughs> I said that deliberately. I said that deliberately as a joke. Here's someone I, I can re relate to, you know, because, you know, I have a need for friendship. You know, I consider you like my friend, you know, because we had little interaction, but, you know, it's just like, it's joyful friendship interaction. So I have a need for friendship. I have a need for uh, presenting empathic communication, helping reform our Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, so the devotees will interact and uh, compassionately. I have a need to please Prabhupada. So by being here, I'm fulfilling all these really cool needs. Mm. You know, this is great. I mean, I'm not, I'm enjoying myself. This is I'm having the time of my life. It's beautiful. So in so here, we could also say that that if we are connecting with our needs better then we'll also we will also be happier and we'll also be able to con help others connect with their needs or at least that habit comes up then we can also start seeing okay this person is behaving like this what could be their need so in one sense thinking deeper level it's mm -hmm. uh, understanding ourselves better we say go deep and see beyond the body to the soul but that also could apply go beyond the immediate behavior to see the deeper need that are driving that behavior yes and that's usually what I try to do. First, I start with myself. What needs are driving my behavior? And it's definitely fulfillment of needs, whatever I do. And then I try to understand. That's empathy with other people. First, you have to be empathic with yourself. Mm. You know, how am I feeling? Actually, there, it's it's several step process. But how am I feeling? And what does that indicate in terms of my needs fulfilled or unfulfilled? And then based upon that realization, I will act in a certain way or ask someone to do something based on that realization. And then once I'm in tune with my own needs, then I can actually be concerned with others' needs. But if I'm not in tune with my own needs, there's no way I'm going to be compassionate. If my needs are not fulfilled, I'm not going to be at all compassionate. I'm going to be like really nasty. <laughs> Beautiful, Maharaj. In one sense, we can even do a compassionate action. We can be speaking the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. We can be giving a book, uh, which is, but we ourselves may not be compassionate in that sense if our needs are not fulfilled. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, we could be doing this for for other other purposes. You know, just you know, we're angry. We want to we want to establish ourselves as a good preacher. But we should be, in turn, this is introspective. I mean, sometimes the sages are described in the Vedic literatures as introspective sages, right? Yes. So introspective yes. means, you know, to look at how I'm feeling and what are my motivations. Motivations are key and needs are motivations. What motivates us is needs. So I believe that every sage should actually be looking inside, should have some quality time with himself or herself and look inside and see, you know, what motivates me? Be honest and vulnerable. I mean, sometimes you can say, you know, what motivates me is just the desire for prestige. <laughs> That's not a need, but, but I may have that desire. There's a difference between desires. I think this is an important point in empathic communication. There's a difference between desires and needs. Desires are strategies to fulfill needs. Like I, I may have a desire to uh, get some ice cream right now and eat some ice cream, which I don't. I'm just making that up. But uh, okay. and, and but what is the need? The need may be for food. And may, me need may be for love. <laughs> Because I associate ice cream 
because of my past conditioning, not me, with love. Like, like many people, it's interesting, many people may be eating, but they're, we find generally the people who are eating too much are eating too much to fulfill their need for love. Or maybe for protection because they've, they've been starving when they were young. You know, so, so the, the action or the desire may not really seem to have a clear connection uh, with the need until you really think about it. So, so we could say lust, anger, greed, envy, all these are not needs. These are, desi these are desires. These are desires, yeah. Lust, anger, greed, envy. Okay. You know, let's say someone may appear to be greedy, but they're just having a need for uh, protection, stability. You know, let's say they've been poverty stricken their whole lives. Just an example. And they just want more and more and more money because they, they feel very insecure. And because they have a, they have a need for security. So, but to identify, once we identify it, then we take care of the lust, anger, and greed. Mm. You know, let, let's say, let's say someone, or let's take lust, you know, this is the big one, the big L. <laughs> let's say someone is lusty after the opposite sex or same sex or whatever it is. Um, and they're just feeling, the, you know, these urges these animalistic urges or whatever like that. If you analyze what is the need, they may, ha they may have a need for companionship or love, and the really, the lust doesn't fulfill any need. The point is, it's a strategy, but it stinks. That's the way I, I look at it. I mean, from Sanyasi's perspective, it's good. <laughs> but it, it's true. I mean, even even from a householder's perspective, lust does not fulfill any need. It's it's a strategy to fulfill a need, but it doesn't actually work. You know, we all have a need for love. We have a need for loving relationships. You know, guya makyati prachati, etc., like that. Uh, but our strategies, in many cases, stink. Stink means bad. <laughs> so we, we have to, what I do is I, I analyze my needs, you know, feelings, needs, express, feel my feelings, are vulnerable to express my feelings, at least to myself, analyze what needs are connected to, and make strategies to fulfill those needs. Oh, beautiful. So otherwise, so if you could consider like, the feelings are here, then the needs are below, and then say yeah, the desires are here. So if we don't yeah, address desires, them, are just simply strategy. Desires are simply no, strategy. So what I'm saying is that some, we could just visualize it. If I don't go to the needs, and the feelings just lead to desires, and we act without even addressing the needs. That's right. So In many I, cases, it's like yeah. that. Yeah. So I feel hungry, and then I don't just eat; I overeat. Because actually the feeling is not just hunger, it is, it is many other feelings. So I could be low, we could be lonely, we could be unhappy or whatever. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, we have, to, we have to figure out our feelings, what needs they're connected to. Mm. And then, then, we can, then we can be very productive in fulfilling that need. You know, I, I have the same needs as everybody else. Everybody has the same needs. I need friends. I need loving relationships. But you know, I, I choose to uh, I choose strategies that are very much consistent with my spiritual life because I I balance all the needs. Oh, here's another. This a, and you know it, it appears a little complicated, but when I'm thinking about strategies to fulfill needs, I look at all the needs holistically, including the need to be Krishna conscious. Okay. And so. Because sometimes you can pick a strategy that will fulfill a need, but it won't, it'll interfere with other needs being fulfilled. Mm. So, so a strategy has to be something that doesn't interfere with other needs. So Maharaj, what you're saying makes intuitive sense. So is it also like the idea of feelings being different from desires and different from needs? 
is there a scriptural basis for this or this is like implicit within the teachings of scripture uh, i think it would be more implicit i can't find any direct uh basis for it in the scriptures yeah. uh i am you know i i am taking a lot of this from psychology modern psychology and from my own experience and uh basically observation of the yeah also in one sense we can say that you could also say yukta vairagya ultimately if this helps us to fulfill the purpose of scripture to fix our mind on krishna to better manage our low manage things like lust anger greed then definitely it mm. is a resource that could be very valuable mm. yeah and there's nothing wrong with lust anger and greed it's just how you manage it like the i mean the uh oh, oh, <coughs> Nectar of instruction states, you know, vacho vegum manas akrota vegum, jiva vegum udra pasha vegum. Doesn't say you you don't have those things. It says you have basically how you manage them. You tolerate. You know, use the word tolerate, but it, but it's how you manage those things. Because you know, like if one represses things or suppresses things, it comes out. You know, the statement is, "What good will repression accomplish?" Yes, nikra kim karishasi. Yeah. It doesn't it yeah it doesn't accomplish anything because it does come out and it comes out at the wrong time. True. All right, what else, what else? I mean I I have a, a volume of things to share but I mean. Yes ma'am. Maybe just I won't take too much of it. I may want to ask questions. So yeah. broadly at a I'm just trying to put this together. so one aspect of it was understanding our needs and our need for autonomy and other things so how yeah. are all these a part of empathic communication or uh, a nonviolent communication you're saying that uh, is it that we need to do this homework ourselves and then we can do it with others and if we start doing it with others then we won't put labels on them we won't be violent in our the way we do it <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think it's it's a question of uh, practice Okay. Because we are out of practice now, we are used to labeling others, we are used to denying responsibility for our own actions and feelings, uh, we are used to controlling others and demanding things from others, and I mean, there's all these blocks of communication which I go into in the course that we need a re-education, and I, I've seen uh, the best way to do that is that we have these practice groups of empathy. And these practice groups right now are uh, going on around the world. I don't know if I mentioned to you, but uh, this book, you know, the book that I presented in the beginning, that you presented in the beginning, has been translated into many different languages, like Chinese, uh, Russian, uh, Hindi, uh, German, Spanish, as a just for a few of them and there's groups going on in these different language areas right now for example uh on the 27th I'm doing a whole seminar with hundreds of devotees from China <clears throat> who've actually been practicing empathic communication uh under the training of uh someone who I trained up in Krishna consciousness her name is Sri Radhika so uh I think it requires some practice I mean I know for myself I do have to practice it because my natural tendency is to put labels on people. Mm. It's uh <clears throat> you know it's just it's just something I have to keep reminding myself about. You know just to look at someone and say they're an idiot, they're useless, they're fallen. Uh I mean even devotees, you know, we do that you know he's stupid. Uh he has uh you know anyway there's so many, so many different labels i put on people so maharaj if somebody wants to join the course is this available online anywhere or how could yeah they're online, <coughs> online courses they're online courses and uh they're being organized by a devotee named shri radhika who's situated in chicago area basically she conducts the courses now you don't yeah we had courses. yeah she does most of the courses now uh we had many many training sessions she first started studying in gita nagri many years ago when we <coughs> did a whole seminar for the devotees and then she took some i <coughs> she, she and others took 
<coughs> excuse me, she and others took uh, some uh, train the trainer courses for me over the period of the uh, pandemic. And then we have a, a group of trainers who are actually are trained up to train others right oh, now. Okay. So, and so and she's, been, totally she's, been, she's been specializing in doing the Chinese group, not because she's Chinese, but because she's a disciple of Rumapad Maharaj, and, uh, and he's very much concentrated on the Chinese uh, devotees. Yes, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, any estimate totally how many devotees uh, may have done the course and be trained in empathic communication till now? I have no idea. <laughs> you have to ask Sri Radhika. I mean, I... Uh, <coughs> I would say that it's numbers in the thousands, but I, I just oh. don't keep a count. So you have been doing this since how long till now? When did you start it? Oh, I think I started in 2005 or something, or 2006. Oh. Nearly 20, so for many, many years. years now. Okay, amazing. Yeah, I, I, originally, I originally started studying uh, mediation for the same purpose, and I, I got... Uh, qualified and certified as a mediator, but I wanted to go further because mediation usually just deals with mediating a particular subject matter, you know, mm. a particular conflict. And conflicts are good. I mean, actually, I I love conflicts. The question is how you resolve conflicts. So, but then I thought, well, mediation doesn't do exactly what I want to do. I want something that's more transformative, that will actually transform relationships rather than just mediate one particular, let's say, a financial dispute or something like that. Okay. So, the empathic communication is meant for transforming relationships between people, both on a group basis and on a uh, individual basis, a one-to-one -one basis. It's amazing. So, it's so inspiring that your thousands of devotees have been trained in this. And uh, when I read your book, I found it was, you could say, like a view of fresh air because you have so many scriptural quotes from Prabhupada and other places. Mm. That we sometimes think that to follow Prabhupada means we have to speak strongly. Yes, we can speak strongly, but speaking strongly doesn't mean that we don't care for each other or we don't, we let to people feeling alienated. So maybe, so it is very important book. And uh, usually at the end of a podcast, I try to summarize what we discussed. Okay. So I'll try to do that. And if you have any concluding words after that, we can discuss. So we Okay. So, you summarize? so we started by talking about how you found that uh, even in the devotee community, the communication was not very loving, the opposite for, and then you started researching why that was. And then you came across that in social, in sociology of religion, psychology of religion, that religious, 80% of religious people are, 80% of religious people are more, Less empathic, or rather less empathic than those who don't belong to religious organizations. Mm. So, and the reason for that, that was quite shocking. So the reason for that could be that in religions, judgment, there is a lot of labeling and judge, judge, making judgments. So mm. inside, la outsiders are labeled. And then in our movement, especially it's quite a bit. So at one level, the things that we do fit broadly the sociology of religion. It's not that we are unique. It is something which is generally there. But uh, so, so the way to deal with it is that actually, ultimately, our philosophy is not so functionally. We could say we need we could need some kind of identifiers, but the problem is not with the labels. The problem is with when the labels disconnect us from the seeing the full person, appreciating the full person. And Prabhupada was expert. Even in Prabhupada, used some labels. He never lost his compassion for the person and. Even in Prabhupada, so in terms of philosophy, making categorical distinctions is important. In terms of interpersonal interactions, it's vital that we that people feel connected and valued and loved. Otherwise, uh, we we will we will there will be a lot of problems in terms of alienation and other things. So then, a discussed about nonviolent communication is so how is empathy measured? So empathy or lack of empathy? Is, how what do it's a matter of perception. Intentions don't matter there. How people feel is what matters. And so then when we talk about empathic, uh, empathic or nonviolent communication, the idea is that instead of, so it's very striking, we say Sarvopadi Vinurmuktam, but we often have the maximum labels on others. And that can be reductionistic. So 
the one way to deal with that is actually to try to connect with the whole person and then even is of simply so we could have a label but make it more like a process and then is mm. not a demon but acting demoniacally and then if we make it that process then you can see okay if they're acting like this why are they acting like this and there we can go back to the needs and to be able to understand others needs you need to first understand our needs and that was a major part of our talk that that say anger is not bad anger is like that indicate car yeah. indicator that some there's something with the car needs to be fixed so 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 now that, that there are our feelings and underlying them there are needs and our desires what come they are just strategies to fulfill the needs but many of the desires are are bad strategies so to the, so so it's not you talk about repression and suppression at denying it to oneself and restraining with others but instead of both those things it is better to introspect and understand ourselves better and thereby we will be able to uh, address our underlying needs and to the extent our needs are fulfilled then we can act in the world to fulfill others needs to understand them better and fulfill their needs and um, overall we also talked about autonomy that one need which is often neglected in religious organizations is auto- the need for autonomy and then that can lead to both the person becoming stunted and losing their moral compass and then they can be like mob psychology can make them do terrible things and on the other hand the the person who is giving guidance can also be burdened so it is impo- better to so independent mentality is not wanting to serve krishna at all autonomy is intelligently consciously choosing how we can best serve krishna so and then then there was also this discussion on broadly that there is that when we are guiding someone it's not that we can ever override their autonomy so if they do something wrong it is we are not culpable for that it is so otherwise we will burden ourselves with that and they they have free will and we can we can best guide them provide them resources so that they can use it freely we use it properly but beyond that we can't do much and so then we discussed further about how for all of us we you discussed lust also lust is could be a need for companionship but it's a i mean the strategy that stinks so like <laughs> so this is something which you could use in the principle of yukta, in the in the with the principle of yukta vairagya to understand ourselves better to connect with others better and that, and that way we all can be we can all have more loving exchanges where we don't judge each other and then we have a need for love and compassion the example of the whale was beautiful that everybody has that need to offer love and compassion and we won't be able to offer it if we first of all have not understood our needs then we are just restless because of that and then if you don't understand other needs we'll just impose labels on them so through empathic communication you know we can all we can say we can more become more content more krishna conscious and help others to become more content and krishna conscious anything you'd like to add further maharaj wow <laughs> you pretty you have pretty good memory <laughs> thank you is that a label <laughs> <laughs> no no that sense an observation <laughs> that you remembered all these things <laughs> yes that well, was beautiful so yeah, yeah that's that's, that's, re- that's really nice did you want to talk did you want to talk about uh the conflict between india and the west now <laughs> can we have a separate podcast on that because that's an important topic and we could uh, we could discuss separately but i can give you a solution right away <laughs> okay yes please <laughs> non violent com- empathic communication no 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 that, i mean that's just a label but anyway so this <laughs> this the, the solution mm. is to this particular conflict because it's based on labels obviously based on different labels rather than seeing the person so the the solution is for devotees to sit individually with each other to try to understand the feelings and needs of the other person. Now we're not talking about groups. We're not talking because as soon as you get mob psychology both on the GBC side or the western side and the eastern side and the northern side and the southern side then you get something then you get group think. Mm. Group think is actually quite dangerous because then we never really understand that people's feelings and needs So 
let's say, let's say, uh, you know, you, my solution is that let's say myself or anybody on the GBC or the pro side or the anti side would sit together one to one and discuss about their own feelings and needs about the particular issue and to appreciate and the other person would reflect there's two different there's different exercises you can do the other person would reflect my feelings and needs I would reveal my feelings and needs and let's say if you were on the other I don't want to use side but we, I was having a discussion with you you would reflect your feelings and needs and you would re, you would reflect my feelings and needs and I would reflect your feelings and needs mm. and then we would switch sides and I would take your position and you would take my position. That's called role playing. Okay. And to try to understand. Because what we have is a, a, is a failure of understanding. It's not a question of throwing out Shastra quotes at each other. Mm. You know, because you can, you can prove any damn thing with Shastra you want. You know that. You know, different different shlokes from different folks, as they say. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so, so these quote wars can go on uh, in forever. And so instead of going through a quote war, trying to understand why a person feels the way they do about a particular issue. You know, whether it happens to be the Vaishnavi Diksha Guru issue, whatever issue you're talking about, you know, why do you feel the way you do? and appreciate and then you can appreciate the person and then you won't have enemy images you may not agree with them mm. it's not a method of coming to agreement this is not a managerial technique that i'm prescribing it's a matter of having loving relationships with each other and respecting other people's point of view we're not we're not going to resolve conflicts in this particular way, but will resolve our relationships. And I think that's more important. Prabhupada would consider our relationship more important than the issues. Does that oh, make sense? That's beautiful. So even if we don't agree on the issue, but still we'll be we will understand each other better and the relationship will be more cordial, more warmer. And that's we'll be loving relationship, you know, so I, I need to understand why you feel a particular way on a particular issue. And to and Krishna Krishna's not going to be displeased because we have different opinions. I mean, that's what can you do? I mean it but Krishna will be displeased if we hate each other. If a Vaishnava hates another Vaishnava, we will lose the mercy of Krishna. I guarantee. That's so I, I think the first point is not to solve the problem, but is to develop loving relationships. We have a problem of relation. It's a relationship problem. It's not an issue problem. That's so true. It's amazing insight, Maharaj. I do hope that it is acted upon and there is a there is a at least a better more empathy, better understanding. Thank you so yeah. much. This is yeah, we have, we have to agree to disagree sometimes. I mean, I'm not. I mean, it, I suggested this to the GBC that we have groups. You know, one or two members of the GBC go to India and meet personally with you know one or two Indian leaders, and basically yeah. they will see that we're not monsters, <laughs> and we will see. That they're they're wonderful devotees. I mean, it's. A, I mean, we're actually right now we're we're basically committing the first offense and chanting Hare Krishna. Right. Oh, okay. To a large extent, different parties are committing the first offense and chanting the holy name, which is blaspheming the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating. The, and you put a label on devotees, you know, someone is chauvinistic, someone is feministic, you know, whatever. Uh, someone is, you know, just non-Brahmin, someone's a Shudra. I mean, you're committing an offense. You know, if you, it, to see a, a Vaishnava, according to that, is, is means hellish. It's like seeing the deity 
being made of uh, stone or wood. I think I think we're sowing the seeds of our destruction if we don't deal with the relationships. To me, yeah. To me, the issue. I don't. You know, whatever. I mean, yeah. It's important to me the issue, but it's really the relationship is a billion times more important. True. Yes, Maharaj. That's a beautiful insight, and I mean, I feel that this is something which we could elaborate more, also. Yeah. So, but it's it's also ultimately to be acted upon. And yeah, I'm it has to be acted upon, and unfortunately, every side in these particular controversies is subjected to group psychology. You know, crowd psychology. There's a there's a whole branch of psychology it's called herd psychology like if you see animals they all function in a herd like cows or something like they follow each other so human beings have this tendency to snap into this herd mentality i know let's say in world war ii you had many people join the nazis who were not like that they were not actually you know, having the same feelings or ideas that the Nazis had, but they snapped into it. And I actually spoke to some people afterwards, and they were embarrassed by what they had done. They thought, wow, how could I have done that? They just snapped into this group mindset. So as long as you have, you know, like this Western group and Indian group or whatever group, then you're never going to deal with the situation. It has to be dealt with on an individual basis. That's so true, Maharaj. Yeah. Oh, okay, hopefully. Thank you, Maharaj. It's amazing. Hopefully, I didn't overburden you with all these different thoughts. No, Maharaj. Thank you. It's an amazing discussion. And let's be the last part of it. It's thought provoking. I'm so grateful to you, Maharaj, for sparing your time. I look forward to having you for a future discussion also. Thank you so much for your sparing your thank, time. Thank you very much for having me and tolerating me. <laughs> <laughs> so my need to have your association for a long time and you helped me to fulfill it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. All glories to Shilpa Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.